r slash discontinence is a strange subreddit to say the least. The description reads, for higher knowledge and unheard subject, worlds found. This is a place where one can share their world or worlds as subjects unheard of elsewhere where they aren't related in topic. It is recommended to switch to new posts on viewing popularity is misleading as top discovery. The community was created by user Sam of Eclia, and the vast majority of the posts made in the subreddits are by the same person. His account was later banned. One of his posts said, Before I smoked my stuff mixed with salt, bong water, and sugar, I tried just heating it with a torch. My stuff, in disapproval, decided to break my thick glass cup on its own as it burnt up. But after I explained it to them, they understood and did not break my pipe, because they knew I did love them. I told them that they had to find a way to get back into my body from there because life is really hard and it can get you like that, so you better be ready to survive it. Plus, I damn well bet when the remains of the stuff get back into my body, the other stuff will hopefully start to get suspicious enough to prepare just in case. If not, they might not even make it. Cause what if I did it that day? They have to get back in or they're screwed, aren't they? So this teaches my stuff that life is hard and to adapt to survive it starting then so they'll be ready for the years after now that are even more risky and dangerous than today. So yeah, the guy is a bit unhinged. Most of his posts are like this, which eventually attracted an audience who wanted to see what the guy was up to. Some users were even more concerned for the guy and asked if he was okay. Sam made the following response. Nah, I'm fine. I just feel like they're starving the poor cause they didn't have the free meal palace open for them today in my city. So now the government is risking its own demise at the fate of what it did to itself, for not respecting the way that lets it live. It's cause they're just not letting people eat anymore. It's cause they're not doing their job anymore. They're trying to steal it from others and so they're gonna be left to not owning any of it anymore. If they just keep trying to starve the poor to have more money for themselves, because there's a limit to how much you can manage to take from people before they snap. The subreddit is now banned, but there is an archived version of the subreddit. If you scroll through it, you would see Sam responds to seemingly simple questions with extremely sophisticated answers that are completely irrelevant to the question. This entry was made on the r slash confession subreddit by user throwawaybaloney8000. It's titled, I lured a homeless woman to my house hoping to F her. I, male, 43 years old, did this almost 10 years ago and it's something I've never told anyone before. It was hugely reckless, manipulative, and occurred during a time of rampant self-destruction and reckless behavior for me following a nasty divorce. I was living alone and very lonely, not finding any luck in regular dating or even one night stands. I started using Craigslist and back pages to find hookups. I connected with a woman, Michelle, who was in a nearby city and claimed to be homeless and looking for help. I'd seen tons of scams like this and fallen for a few where a personals ad was really just step one of a larger scheme to get some fast cash. I decided to play along a little and we chatted for a day or so. We were connecting and I began to think she was telling the truth. Or at the very least, a very consistent storyteller. We exchanged pics and she was reasonably okay looking, older than me by about 7 years, but not some bag lady type person. Honestly, not someone I would have otherwise pursued, but for the fact that I thought if I gave her a place to sleep, she'd be grateful. So we made arrangements for me to come meet her downtown one evening and we had coffee in a diner. She was actually sort of kind of cute in person. She was really short, but very loud, intelligent. She was crafty and showed me pictures of a bunch of stuff she'd made by hand, like knitting and dollhouse furniture. She loved sending physical letters and cards in the mail. She loved handwriting and calligraphy and said letters felt more personal than texting or emails. But she was also definitely a bit weird. I remember she had some really strong opinions about mundane food choices and went off on some bizarre conspiracy theory tangents with next to no prompting. I chalked it up to her living on the streets and thought I could probably manage a little weird if it meant I could get what I wanted. I decided to roll the dice because above all other things, I was incredibly desperate. I invited her back to my apartment, saying she could stay with me a few days if she wanted. She didn't hesitate even a second. She only had two small bags with her, so we grabbed those and took off back to my apartment. 
To be absolutely clear again, I was not doing this to be a good guy or because I cared about her. At no point did I ever genuinely want to help this woman or improve her life. This was 100% in the hopes of getting her comfortable enough at my place that we'd hook up. Every dollar I spent in gas or coffee was mentally calculated as a cost of getting to that point. Every kindness and word I said that first night was part of a larger design. At the time, I think I was even trying to fool myself into thinking I was being a nice guy, but now, years later, I can see how manipulative it all was. I never intended to physically force her to do anything she didn't want to, but I was most definitely trying to build a path towards us having and I was definitely abusing a power dynamic by trying to create a situation where she was 1. at my place with no convenient means to leave on her own and 2. felt obligated to repay my generosity. So we get back to my apartment and I let her shower, get cleaned up, have a late night snack. We watch some TV and cuddle up on the couch and she's just incredibly grateful and also very clingy. She would sit really close and at one point asked if we could hold hands. Later, she broke down a little and cried because she said she'd not felt safe in probably 8 months or so. She had been either staying on the streets, in shelters, cars, or with someone who was dangerous because she had no other options. She thanked me repeatedly for being kind and giving her a chance. Each time I told her it was no problem, I was happy to do it, I was so glad I could help, etc. But none of that was true. I was still just waiting for the right time to see if I could pivot into something physical. She asked how long she could stay. We'd already discussed this before I agreed to let her come over and I told her just 3 days. I had partial custody of my kids at this time and could not let her be there while the kids were with me. She seemed to swing wildly back and forth between sadness, gratitude, and not knowing what to do next. I couldn't be sure I would succeed if I made a move, so I left it alone. As the night wore on, I told her I needed to get to bed because I had to work tomorrow, and she said okay, but just sort of sat and waited for me to do or say something else. I walked her back to my kids' room and told her she could sleep in there. There was a bunk bed and lots of clean linens and stuff in there, and I said I would be right down the hall if she needed anything in the night. I could tell she was really surprised. I started to realize that I was not being smooth or clever and that she 100% expected and anticipated me wanting her to come to my bed. And I know now I am not the first or last guy to abuse her in this way and I think vulnerable people just sort of get used to being taken advantage of. I wanted it to be her choice and didn't want to tell her or even suggest to her to come to my room. In my messed up head, I thought that still made me somewhat honorable, so I left her there and she slept in my kid's bedroom all night and I slept in mine. I waited up about 45 minutes, hoping she'd come down the hall. At one point, I heard her get up and use the hall toilet and I got excited thinking this is it. But then she went back to the other room. We woke up the next morning and she was so happy. She said it was the best night's sleep she'd had in a very long time. We had a quick breakfast and coffee that morning before I left for work and she asked if I could give her some cash for the day. Alarm bells were ringing in my head. She claimed she wanted to walk to the nearest store and get some cleaning supplies and clean my apartment as a thank you for letting her stay. I told her she didn't need to do that or repay me at all but she really wanted to. So I gave her $50 and left her there in the apartment for the day. In hindsight, it was an insanely stupid thing to do. I could have been completely cleaned out and robbed by the time I came home. She could have invited other people over, gotten high, or trashed a place. We texted a little during the day, but I never knew for sure what I was going to come back to, so I was getting increasingly anxious. And up to the point that I actually walked in, I was still half expecting her to be gone, along with my TV and anything else of value. But no, she was there and had done exactly what she'd said. She'd walked into Walmart and gotten a bunch of stuff, cleaners and a new mop, and had cleaned my whole kitchen and both bathrooms, vacuumed and everything. When I got home, she ran up to me and hugged me and it was like we'd been living together for a long time. She showed me everything she cleaned and playfully reprimanded 
and me for not having better supplies. She asked about my day and how I was doing and we just had a great rhythm and a lovely evening. I remember she asked the cook and I said sure but because I was an idiot single guy at the time I didn't have much. She made some kind of chicken something dish from what she could find and it was honestly pretty terrible. But I smiled and thanked her and told her it was great because it was a sweet gesture and also because everything seemed to be coming together. We cuddled again that night watching a movie and this time she started to get pretty bold. She would hug me and run her hands under my shirt, put her fingers through my hair, lay her head on my shoulder, and touch my legs a lot. I just let her do whatever she wanted. I gave her very little back. I wanted to do more but as soon as my plan started to obviously work, I began to feel incredibly guilty and like a complete piece of crap for everything I'd done up to that point. The night went on and it was getting late. I told her again I needed to get to bed because of work in the morning. As we walked down the hall, I started to tell her good night at the other room and she just asked, can I sleep in your bed instead? And I said, I don't want you to feel like you have to do that. Absolute lie. I orchestrated this moment to make her feel that way and definitely wanted her in there. She said, no, I want to. This bed is nice, but I want to be next to you if that's okay. So we both went to my room. Now, I don't know if she had decided to come in during the day besides to clean the adjoining bathroom or if she would have respected my privacy, but she at least acted surprised because my bed's way nicer than the kids' bunk beds, obviously. She kind of hopped and bounced a little, laughing like a kid, and she looked so happy to be there. I stripped down too and really enjoyed just getting to see her whole body at last. As soon as the lights went down, she got really aggressive right away. I do remember though, she was a terrible kisser. She did this thing where she would kind of open and close her mouth while she kissed like she was chomping. But this was what I'd been planning for and so we went for it. The next day, it was like something had completely lifted for me. Call it clarity I guess, but I had gotten what I wanted out of this exchange so I was ready to move on. And I started to think more and more about how dangerous and reckless I'd been in this whole scenario. That next morning, she was sort of idly talking about the weekend coming up. I reminded her that I had told her she could only be here for three days. I could tell she was hoping that the previous night might have changed things but I held firm. I began to immediately pull away emotionally because I didn't want to be manipulated into changing my mind. I got a bit colder to her and left for work again that morning. The whole way there I was cursing my stupidity at being so cold. Not because I'd obviously hurt her feelings, but because now she might want to punish me, and I just left her alone again at my place. I got back home that evening and everything was fine. She had gone back to the store and gotten some more food and had a nicer dinner waiting for me. I tried to be so nice but was in such a crappy mood on the inside. I think because she was doing everything she could think of to show me how nice it was for her to be there to be grateful and all I could do was to see it through the same lens I'd use on her. That she was now manipulating me and trying to get me to fall for her so that I'd let her stay. I tried not to let it show but I think she could definitely pick up on the change in the atmosphere. I said a few times that night about how I'd need to drop her off at some point the next day before my kids came over, either before work or right after I got back, making it clear the plan wasn't going to change. By the end of the evening, she'd made arrangements for a friend to come and pick her up. I told her, you can't let them in here, you know that right? And I could tell it really hurt her feelings. She said she understood. When it was time for bed, the mood lifted a little, and we both got playful with each other again. We both slept in my room again that night, and despite how I had acted, she was still all over me once the lights went off. I remember thinking in the dark while her head was on my chest and I was playing with her hair. I imagined what my life might be like if I decided to treat this woman like an actual person and not just use and discard her. But then I tried to imagine how I'd explain her to other people or what my friends would think of her. Someday, it might come out what I've done, and someone else would see through my BS and realize I had manipulated her. So I started to focus on everything she'd done that I didn't like, like the bad food and the terrible kissing, the weird conspiracy stuff, and I just closed my mind to anything else. I'd done something reckless but made it out with my kidneys intact and shouldn't try to push my luck any further. The next morning, I was feeling terrible but wouldn't budge on her having to leave. I never even asked her where she would actually go or who the friend was that was picking her up. All that mattered was that she was gone by the time I came back from work. She asked to keep in touch and for a way to send me a letter, so I gave her my P.O. box. She texted me during the day to tell me she got off safely, and sure enough, she was gone by the time I got home. 
She left the place in great condition and even made the beds. I remember because my kids were like, Dad, why did you do that? Because I have never once made theirs for them. We chatted via text for a little while longer. I want to say maybe a few weeks at most. Just very superficial, hey how are you, hope things are good type texts. She had gone back to the city where there were more resources for her and had hopes for a job lead. I just gradually stopped replying much and then at some point she never texted again. I am telling the story now in all its detail because I was and am a complete piece of crap. I took advantage of this vulnerable woman for my gain. I didn't actually care about her or her situation or what happened to her when I was done. I didn't rape her by the technical definition, but I definitely coerced her and manipulated her. I tried to justify it in my head by saying that these were her own choices, but I told her lies that I thought she'd want to hear, and I intentionally created a situation where she would have those choices to make. So now I can say unequivocally I did something truly awful to this poor woman. It's something I will hide for the rest of my life out of shame and guilt because I know it was terrible and it makes me question the kind of person I truly am at my core for having done it. The account is named as a throwaway but it seems that the user is still active on it with the last comment being made about a week before this recording. If you take a look through OP's account history, you'll find comments revolving around manipulation as well as relationships in general. And the comments to OP's post are a bit worrisome to say the least, but then again, it's Reddit. I'm not sure what I was expecting in the first place. For example, one comment says, I found this story strangely moving. I don't think you should be hard on yourself. Everyone at some point has conspired to do something nefarious in their lives at some point. I think you actually showed the lady that not everyone, especially men, maybe are not all bad. There are surprisingly a lot of comments similar to this. And to that other comment, it's not like he was intentionally trying to show that men were not as bad. If she knew his true intentions, she would likely also become one of those people that just constantly rant, all men are the same. But anyway, this topic is pretty sensitive, so let me know what you think in the comments. This post was made back on June 3rd, 2020 and involves a pretty disturbing looking image. What exactly is happening in the photo is a mystery. Any idea what's happening in this photo? Someone in a mom's group I am in on Facebook said someone she knows found this in a book bought at Goodwill. She claims to have given it to police. My first thought was it's prob from a movie but can't find anything on Tinai. Thoughts? Looks like a guy face down in water on the left with his feet bound and on the right, a guy with knees up tied to his body. Also, shadows look like a guy holding a gun. Various Reddit users have tried to enhance the image to get a better look, and I'm gonna be honest, I had a very tough time discerning details in this image at first. There's the obvious person on the right in a red shirt with his hands tied behind him, and then in front of him is a person who seems to be lying on their stomach. You can see their hands tied behind their back as well as their feet. There's also a shadow on the land that looks like it belongs to a person. It seems that the shadow is making its way to what seems to be a car door, which can be seen by the shadow in front of it. Most wanted to believe that the photo was a hoax or part of some movie, but later it was suggested that the person shown in the photo was a missing person, specifically Teddy Franks, who has now been missing for over three decades. Teddy disappeared on Labor Day weekend 1986. According to his sister Michelle, Teddy and his wife engaged in a heated argument which led to Teddy taking off. From there, he went to his other sister's home, Renee, who then drove Teddy to a business on Jackson Lane in Middletown, Ohio. But right as the two were nearing the business, Teddy began to panic at the sight of another person. He jumped out of the vehicle and ran to the back of the Sitgo gas station. This would mark the final time he was seen. Most of his friends and family are of the belief that he is no longer alive, and they received little updates in regards to Teddy until that photo we just went over made its rounds across the internet. When Teddy's sisters were shown the image, they weren't certain whether the man was Teddy or not. Another theory suggests that the man pictured is Christopher Lorette, who is another missing person who disappeared in August of 1977. Due to the poor quality of the original image, it's extremely difficult to identify the man in it. One Reddit user proposed the idea that the image was from the movie Deliverance. However, the film does not have a scene with this photo, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't related to the film, as the scene in the photo may have been cut in the final rendition. Another user attempted to find out what 
what kind of book the image was found in and it was later revealed that it was housed in a scrapbook and it was the only image remaining inside. Many people wanted the photo to be scanned in order to find developer marks to possibly locate where it was printed and by whom, but it seems that this was never done. Furthermore, there was a comment made by OP where it seemed that the origin of the book was from Washington State, making it very likely that the photo was also taken in the same place. However, the original comment seems to have been deleted, but if true, Washington does have one of if not the highest rate of serial killings which makes the image all the more eerie. This entry refers to a Reddit user named fstopvox, who started a subreddit called r slash fstopfitzgerald with a description that said, a repository for all my recordings. The subreddit accumulated over 5,000 members at its peak, but was eventually shut down. But for what reason you may ask? Well, that's because fstopvox was using it to share inappropriate content involving minors. To make matters worse, this content was created by himself. F Stop Vox was revealed to be a man named Richard Burdett who was 55 years old at the time of his arrest. On April 20th, 2022, the Toronto Police Service Child Exploitation Team executed a search warrant issued towards Richard. He was charged with child luring, making child possessing it, accessing it, and making it. The subreddit was said to have contained explicit scripted content. To add, Richard was actually a high school drama teacher who had sent out well over 1,000 sexually charged messages to a single female student at the school. To my knowledge, I don't think he actually got serious prison time. Okay, so this entry was straight up disgusting and after reading it, I was thinking about not including it, but hey, I'm sure some of you guys will get some form of entertainment out of this. And at first, I thought that perhaps this was fake, but the story is so absurd, it's probably real. The post was created by user MK underscore Martian. It's titled, I used to search the garbage in my friend's house for tampons to smell. This is kind of embarrassing and I don't know how I got the idea to do it. It all started when I was 16. I was at my aunt's house. I was taking a dump and when I wiped and opened the garbage to throw the paper, I saw the tampon sitting there inside waiting for me. I couldn't help myself but to grab it and smell it. This became a habit over time. Every time I would go to someone's house, the first thing I would do is search the garbage. Became an addiction. Thank god though, I'm 18 now and this addiction is long gone and hopefully something no one else does. LMAO. Yeah, a wild story. Bojo here took the words right out of my mouth. It's okay to not post some things. Another user said, it would have cost you zero dollars not to post this. You have dishonored your ancestors on this day. There probably is a high likelihood that this story is fake, but again, it's just so wild, like why would anyone even lie about this in the first place? This entry was made in r slash rbi by user prolapse this. It was titled, Police Didn't Investigate and It's Bothering Me. At around 8.30pm, I arrived home from a quick trip to town to grab a beer. As I got out of my car, I could hear something. I thought for a moment that I had left the TV on and was hearing it from the outside. But as I walked to the front of my car and pressed the lock button on my remote, I realized that what I was hearing was screaming. I listened for a second, thinking it was somebody screwing around, but then the woman's voice screamed, No, stop. You're you're hurting me, you're killing me, and an adult male voice yelling something I couldn't make out. There was a dog barking from the same direction as well as repeated thudding noises. I immediately dialed 911 and told the police. They could even hear the screaming in the background. They said they'd send an officer to drive by, but an hour passed and none came. I watched for them on my security cameras. The camera on my back door only records when it detects a humanoid shape, so it caught me making the phone call and a little of the screaming in the background. The backyard camera caught it all, but it is unintelligible due to outdoor AC unit noise. I cleaned up the audio as best I could, but I need advice on how to proceed. I am attaching a Dropbox link to the video. I also included the original in the second half of the video. If you watch it, the screaming coming from directly where the camera is pointed, but more than 50 feet away across a narrow field. 
There is a small shack that has a couple of cars usually parked at the road, just on the other side of the field. It is bothering me a lot since I'm 41 years old and have never heard anything so disturbing in real life. Update, I guess they finally had a reason to go out and check the property I was trying to tell them to look at. There are sheriff's cars all over the place and cops in gloves walking in and out of this garage, and one cop throwing up in the front yard. I have a picture, but I can't add it to an update. So after listening to the camera audio, it is nearly impossible to discern any words that are being said as OP stated, but it's clear that someone is in distress. The original post was made in late July of 2021, so it took about two months before police actually investigated the matter. And based on OP's description, it definitely seems like someone lost their life that night. Who knows, if police took her seriously and investigated the property that same night it was reported, a life may have been saved. But then again, we aren't entirely sure if someone even died. At least, that was the case until OP gave an update saying, Welp, murder it is. I posted last year about coming home and hearing a female voice screaming for her life. I posted a video with the audio of the screen and got plenty of comments. About two months later, the house that it was coming from had the sheriff's cars all around it. I found out that an elderly man had committed suicide via gunshot, and that his son was the only person at home and the person who reported that his father had shot himself. Fast forward to last week, I was sitting at home watching YouTube when I heard gunshots. I live in the country and that's common, so I didn't think anything of it. Turns out, it was the sound of that son murdering his mother. He is trying to claim self-defense, but he is being charged with murder. I lived next door and my security cameras caught the audio of the murder. It also captures the vehicle the son made his getaway in. I've had detectives in and out gathering video footage for the past week. This is a family annihilator. They are now looking at him for the murder of his father as well. The case has been reopened and they have now recognized that my calls and reports were actually real. Two lives could have been saved. I'm going to link the story. Also, wouldn't Tim Johnson, the second Tim, be Tim Johnson Jr.? In the linked article, it was shared that the woman slash mother who died was named Stephanie Cheney. Her son, Tim Johnson II, was 40 years old at the time and admitted to taking his mother's life. The the incident took place in Highland County, Ohio. This next post was created in r slash rbi and was made by user paganprincess22. It was titled, A woman posing as a nurse stole my blood from Indiana, USA emergency room in 1996 to 1997, when I was 5 or 6 years old. Hello everyone, I'm not sure if this is the correct place, so feel free to direct me to a better subreddit if there is one. I flared it as a cold case because it happened 23 years ago, but there were never charges filed to my recollection and I don't remember a case being made from it. This is a strange story and I was 5, maybe 6 when it happened, so I don't have a lot of details. I had recently told my younger sister about this story and she encouraged me to look into the incident more and see if I can find out either who this person was or if there was a larger pattern of behavior during the time frame. I'm interested in any information you all have to offer slash can find on the matter as I truly just want to satisfy some curiosity. I'm 99% sure any statute of limitations is up, and I'm not interested in reporting something so weird and from so long ago to the police, for them to tell me that there's nothing that can be done. 
Now on to the story. When I was around 5 to 6, I got a pretty bad nosebleed that wouldn't stop. I eventually started throwing up big clots of blood as well and my mother took me to the ER. This would be in slash around the Sunman or Indianapolis area of Indiana in USA, but I do not know the name of the hospital. At the time, beds were separated only by curtains on ceiling tracks and not individual walled rooms. My mother had left my quote unquote room to speak to a doctor, I think, I know she left, and a woman I did not know came in shortly after she left. She was white, had medium brown hair, and looked to be in her 20s to 30s. She was wearing a blue scrub shirt with puppy dogs on it and unmatched pants. I want to say she was not wearing scrub pants, but rather jeans or maybe sweatpants. I know they did not match her shirt, which stood out to me. The other nurses and doctors I saw only wore solid colored scrubs and were all matched. She said she needed to take some blood and pulled the tools to do so from her scrub's pocket, not a phlebotomy cart. She stuck me and started drawing blood, somewhere around 5-7 to seven vials of it, but potentially more. On the last vial, we heard my mom and a doctor coming back towards the room. She hurriedly ripped the tube from my arm before the last vial was full. It spilled some blood. She did not give me a band-aid or gauze, she just left me bleeding, and shoved everything back into her pocket, then ran from the room. She ran to the left and my mom and doctor entered from the right. The doctor said a nurse would be with me soon to draw some blood and run some tests. I told him a lady had already taken my blood and he asked what she looked like and where she went. I described her, he turned wide eyed to my mother and said she doesn't work here and ran out of the room to the left. I heard some voices, there was a lot of commotion, but I don't remember anything past that point other than just feeling dizzy and now scared that some strange woman had my blood. I've never been able to find out what the hell happened, who this woman was, and if she was ever caught. If this type of thing was happening across the country at time, I have no idea. Let me know if there's any other information I could provide that might make it easier to find out what happened to my blood. Edited a typo and to add, my mother is not a great source of information when it comes to my early life, or her life, or anything really, as she has some of her own issues. Several years ago when I was a teenager, she confirmed the details I remember then refused to talk further about it and asked me not to bring it up. She claims she does not remember the name of the hospital, the name of the doctor, or other details I was asking for at that time. This story is definitely pretty creepy as it's kind of grounded in reality. Whenever I'm put in a situation where I have to confide and trust in a professional or person of authority, I typically do it blindly. The thought that someone is masquerading as a health professional just so they can exploit me makes me wildly uncomfortable. Various Reddit users attempted to strum up theories to try and explain the story. One one user suggested the possibility that OP was adopted and this fake nurse was actually OP's biological parent, stealing blood to prove that they were related. However, this was quickly shot down after OP stated that her birth certificate lists her two parents as her birth parents. Additionally, her physical appearance resembles both her mom and sister. This entry was created by Reddit user Definitely Not Don't Look At Me. It was titled Try Out Super Yummy Gamer Subs Today and Use My Code DLAM at Checkout for 10% off your purchase, or use the link in the description. I am one of those creatures that needs my daily fix of caffeine in the morning to get my day started, so that's why I'm happy to be partnering up with Gamer Subs to bring you all a discount. They sent me out some samples, and never in a million years would I have ever expected to say that I love titty milk. Gamersups is a healthier alternative to your typical energy drink and much cheaper. You can get yourself 100 servings of titty milk or whatever flavor you want for just 40 cents a serving. You can also try out some of their other wacky flavors including Grandpa's Ashes, Guacamole Gamer Fart, Emotional Damage, and much more. Guacamole Gamer Fart was also surprisingly pretty good. Again, use my code DLAM, all caps, at checkout for a discount. I also get a bit of a kickback when you use my code, so it helps out the channel as well, so it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you to Gamersubs for supporting the channel, and back to the video.
So this entry was made on r slash popping over a decade ago where OP sent a photo of what I can only describe as flesh. This thing apparently came out of her reproductive organs and I definitely cannot show you guys the actual photo but good old Justin Wang talked about this 6 years ago on his channel and this madman actually posted the photo so if you want to bless your eyes with some good old flesh check that video out. According to one user this thing is an endometrium which is just essentially tissue. Then another user said that it looks similar to bacon. This prompted OP to fry it in a pan and she claimed that it smelled amazing but they refrained from eating it. Just a strange post in general. This entry was posted in r slash ask reddit under a post that was asking people for the creepiest thing that has happened to them. One user by the name bingbong1234 said, I've been waiting a long time to tell reddit the full story of The Whistler. The story requires many details but it is unexplainable and 100% true. I also have video evidence. When I was about 8 years old, I was taking my dog for a walk through the neighborhood with my mom. It was maybe 11pm. We live next to a swamp slash woody area on the edge of our neighborhood in Lansing, Michigan. I remember it being very silent and slightly windy. From down in the swamp, we heard somebody whistling at us. It sounded sort of like a bird, but each whistle was different enough where the lack of consistency made it human-like. The whistle sounded higher than lower. I can't really describe it. My mom had a concerned, slightly terrified look on her face and grabbed my hand and said that we should go inside quickly. I didn't understand because I was too young, but seeing my mom freak out made me freak out too. After a while though, I kind of forgot about it. Two years later, I was taking my dog out again late at night. There is a large bush that could easily obscure a person behind it just next to the front door. As I was finishing the walk, the whistling noise started again. Same pitches, same inconsistent human-like tones. As soon as I heard it, a chill went down my spine as I remembered exactly the feeling of seeing my mom, terrified, looking down into the swamp at something I couldn't see. Maybe she couldn't either. I ran inside as fast as possible. Years went by and I thought about it less and less. I told only a handful of people and eventually it slipped from my mind completely. Fast forward to last summer. I'm 24, started dating my girl Sarah. We moved out to South Dakota for work. For Independence Day, we decided to go to Pierre SD and watch the fireworks along the bank of the Missouri River. There was a free camping spot behind a hospital where you could pitch your tent, hang out, and see the fireworks up the river. We were near the end of the campground and there were very few people around us. As it was getting dark, the fireworks began. They were pretty far away, so the illumination they brought was very little. Thus, we had to sit right at the edge of the river to be able to see them. A huge thunderhead was moving in and a storm was imminent. So the air seemed electric and the wind was picking up. The atmosphere was eerie to say the least. The police boats herded all the other boats off of the river and had left our area to do that elsewhere. Most of the other campers walked up the river to have a better view of the fireworks. But Sarah and I stayed back and were drinking PBR tall boys and kicking it. Suddenly, we heard the sound of a paddle methodically dipping into the water. We saw a figure steering a canoe about 20 meters offshore. Sarah decided to go get more beers from the car, leaving me alone to stare at this mystery person. And then, of course, they whistled at me. My entire body was frozen and covered in goosebumps. It was the exact same whistler from my childhood, more than a decade earlier. I looked at the figure, but it was much too dark to discern who it could be. They were wearing a hat. When they were perpendicular to the shore from me, they stopped paddling, turned the canoe to face directly at me, and whistled right at me. I was so frightened I stood up and shouted at them, who are you? They didn't say anything, just whistled a couple more times, turned the canoe 180 degrees, and paddled out of sight. I'm a videographer, so I already had my camera by my side and was taking videos of the fireworks. As the canoe was almost out of sight, I grabbed my camera and got a shot of them whistling as they went away. When Sarah came back from getting beers, she was very confused as to why I was so freaked out. When I explained, she was freaked out a bit too. I was convinced we would both be murdered that night. How did this whistling person follow me after 14 years all the way to South Dakota? Was it a coincidence? Why was it the same whistling noise? Who was that person and where did they go? So many questions still unanswered. To this day, I'm more afraid of being outside in the dark where I might hear that whistling again. 
I'm open to any explanations. If there is interest, I will find a plug and edit a little video of the fireworks and the whistling noise and the canoe disappearing. I'm in Uganda currently and the internet is spotty where I am, so I'll do my best. Edit. Video is coming, I promise. Where I'm at in Uganda, the power goes out sometimes, so if you don't hear from me, either that happened or the whistler finally got me. Edit 2. Okay, finally. I've spent all afternoon uploading this video. Here is the link to the video. Are you whistling? Is that you? Stop it. When I was still getting shots of the fireworks, I heard the whistling starting. I was too afraid at that moment to point the camera directly at the canoe, so I just turned my microphone towards it and kept a low-key shot facing downriver towards the fireworks. If you wear headphones, you can hear it better. It's the two-note whistle, high then low. You can hear me ask my GF, are you whistling? Is that you? She said no, but I wasn't sure, so I told her, stop it, because I was getting scared. The last shot, I boosted the brightness as much as I could and still make out the person in the canoe. It looks like they're wearing a red sweater or something. Edit. It's been a while and I apologize for that. I'm back in the US now and I asked my mom about it. I sat her down and played the video for her. She honestly doesn't remember anything like that happening. I wish I had something more exciting to say. Alas, it must remain a mystery. A lot of people believe that something supernatural is occurring here with OP. One user compared the Whistler to a Venezuelan legend referred to as El Sabon, which is said to be a translation of the Whistler. This user translated a bit of an article and asked OP if it was in any way similar to what they experienced. And again, this is translated, so some of the stuff might not make very much sense. The article said, the legend is that of a young man who killed his father as a revenge because he had killed his wife. After this event, his grandfather had him tied to a pole in the middle of a field and whipped him, had his wounds cleaned with drinking alcohol, and released him with two rabid and hungry dogs, but before release, he cursed him to carry his father's bones for the rest of eternity. He has a particular whistling similar to music notes C, D, E, F, G, A, B in that order, going up to F and then going low to B. It's said that when whistling is heard closely, there is no danger because he is really far, but when the whistling sounds far, he is really close. It's also said that the whistling announces the death of those who hear it. He can be anywhere at any time. It seems that the only thing that can save the person that hears it from afar is the bark of a dog because he is afraid of it, also of chili peppers and whips. The soul takes revenge on womanizing men. Many inhabitants of Los Llanos speak of seeing him, particularly during summer, season in which the Venezuelan savanna sears under the strength of drought and El Sabon sits in the stumps of trees and gathers dust with his hands. But he is primarily encountered in times of humidity and rain, when the specter roams hungry for death and avid to punish the drunk, the 
fishmongers and from time to time an innocent victim. It's said that he sucks on the navel of drunk men when he finds them alone to drink the alcohol that they drink and he rips apart the fishmongers, he takes off the bones and puts them inside the bag in which he carries his dad's remains. Some versions say that he looks like a long giant, 6 meters tall, who walks from treetop to treetop while he emits his terrifying whistling and rattles inside the dusty old bag. The pale bones of his misfortune father, or as some claim, his multiple victims. Other versions state that he presents as the shade of a tall and slender man with a hat, especially to drunk people. It is said that El Sabon may appear near a house on some nights, leaving the bag on the floor and counting the bones one by one. If one or more people hear him, nothing will happen, but if no one hears, by dawn a family member will die in his sleep. The Colombian Eastern Llanos, where he is called El Silvador, they believe is the wandering soul of a party-loving womanizer who died in solitude, and people claim that he seeks the company of someone who dares ride horseback late at night. Also in Colombia, some others say he chases pregnant women, that his whistling penetrates the ear, chills, and that, if someone hears a high pitch tone, it omens the death of a woman, while a low pitch tone omens the death of a man. In any case, that woman or man is generally someone known by the one that heard the whistling. Of course, whenever it comes to the topic of the supernatural, many people are skeptical, but let me know what you think in the comments. This post was created in r slash confessions on January 19th, 2017 by user throwaway181718. It was titled, I was in a cult. Firstly, apologies for my anonymity. I don't want this to get back to me, but I haven't told anyone about this. I need to get it off my chest. Three years ago when I was in college, I was suffering with severe depression. I took medication and attended therapy and group therapy. One day in my group therapy, our therapist told us that there's a man here to talk to us. For reasons, let's call him Bob. Bob was really energetic, really friendly and understanding. He spoke to us on our level, a bunch of vulnerable teenagers. He told us about a group therapy holiday. We go away over the summer holidays and do some cool things like rafting, rock climbing, etc. He explained that it was completely free because the college would pay for us to go and it lasts 5 weeks. Not many people were interested, but I decided to ask him a few questions after the session. He told me that it was all about adventure, making friends, and having fun, whilst continuing our therapy. I asked for some details off him, but he didn't have a card, so he asked for mine. Stupidly, I gave him my phone number, email address, and home address. Later that night, I was telling my parents about it. They seemed a little suspicious, but I was trying to convince them. Whilst we were talking, there was a knock at the door. It was Bob. My dad welcomed him in, and he spoke to both of them, explaining that it is good for my mental health, and it's also a lot of experiences, as well as completely free. After talking for a while, my parents agreed that I could go. They filled out some paperwork, and the next time I saw Bob was when I got on the coach, with lots of other people around my age. Bob was really enthusiastic, and everyone looked excited, albeit we were all having mental health issues. Bob explained that on our first day, we would be doing an adventure course and building a raft to help with teamwork with our fellow campers. We drove north to a walled off campsite. It was huge. As we got off the bus, everyone had to go for a physical checkup. It was uncomfortable, but I assumed it was to make sure we could take part in the events. The doctor was very thorough. When we left, we couldn't find our suitcases, so we guessed they were brought to our rooms. But when we got to our rooms, they weren't there either. I asked Bob and he said we weren't allowed them and we weren't allowed phones either. He asked for all our phones, me and the other boys in my room refused, but then he said that it was in the contract we signed. Reluctantly, we all gave up all our possessions and he gave us these ugly tracksuits to wear because we didn't want our nice clothes to get dirty. We did some activities and they were fun, but then we all went for dinner. Before anyone started eating, one of the group leaders said that we should all pray. I'm not religious and there wasn't any indication that this was a religious group, so I was a bit confused. 
The group leader said we should be thankful towards the gods for bringing us all together. I thought that this was weird, but thought that he was just being inclusive of everyone's religions. Later that night, we all went to bed. That same night, another group leader named Todd came in and forced us all to stand up. He told us off for sleeping in our boxers and said that we should sleep in our tracksuits. So we put them on, but then took them back off after he left. It was summer after all. It was really hot. The next few days were pretty much all the same. There were some fun group activities, but they all ended with the group leaders acting very strange and rather strict. The boys and girls were not allowed to talk to each other. When we went swimming, we went in our tracksuits and were only really allowed to talk to each other during these activities. Every meal, we had to pray and the leader would say something like, the gods will show us the way to the end. We did exciting activities and some boring ones that included meditation. We were told that we could stay after the five weeks and if we wanted, we could even invite our families. One evening, I asked Bob if I could call my family because I wanted to talk to them, but he said that he already told my family that I had arrived safely. I insisted, but we got in an argument and Bob said that I could not call my family until the five weeks were up. They took my suitcase, so I had no way to find my stuff. That evening, there was a campfire event. It was integrated with the group therapy session. I asked to use the bathroom and went off in search of my stuff. I snuck into an office where there was a phone that I used to call home. I told my mom what was happening and she said that they'd be there right away to pick me up. In the back room was a bunch of suitcases and a plastic box filled with phones. It took a while to find my phone, but I found it and snuck it in my pocket. Then I tried looking for my suitcase, but Todd walked into the office and found me. He practically dragged me out and sat me down in the hallway. He yelled at me for disobeying the rules. He took me back to the group and told me to stay put. He then told the other group leaders what had happened and they were all angry, so they went over all of the rules. We were then all sent back to our rooms without dinner. In bed, I was texting my dad who said they were arriving now. I made sure the other boys didn't see my phone. At some point, my dad texted me saying that they were outside, so I pretty much jumped out of bed and ran towards the entrance. The group leaders tried to stop me, but luckily I was able to get past them. Down the dirt road at the edge of the campsite, I could see the car. During this time, all of the group leaders were chasing me. My dad got out of the car and when I got in, my mom locked us in. The group leaders were saying that we signed a contract and that I was not allowed to leave until the five weeks were over. My dad refused and they tried to open the doors. Somehow, my dad got back in without letting any of the group leaders in. At home, I told my parents everything. The next morning, Todd and everyone else were at my front door. My dad told them to go away as they tried to get me to come back. My dad said no and called the police who escorted them away. I pretty much never left the house all summer, but when I started college and went to my bus, I could hear Todd and his group chasing after me. They surrounded me on the street, but neighbors heard all of the commotion and some people came out and a fight broke. I was able to get back to my house and lock myself in. The group leaders were arrested when police arrived, but the next week, a new group of people under Todd came to our neighborhood. I stopped going to college and my family and I had to move to a new area. We started a whole new life. We weren't in a witness protection program, but we used fake names and identities to prevent them from finding us. My mom called the college and the police and we learned that Todd had taken his own life. I don't know much else than that, but I hope everyone else in the group is okay. So this original post is now deleted, but quite a few large YouTubers have touched upon this topic, and it seems there's a split amongst people who think it's real or fake. OP would later make an update to the post saying, I never intended for this to be a potential way of exposing the group, and I didn't expect it to have such a huge and supportive reaction. As some of you have some questions, I'd love to answer them, but still, I wish to remain anonymous and not give away too much information. In response to all the questions about my phone, I didn't think it was worth mentioning that I turned it off before I handed it over. I haven't heard from any of the teenagers in the group since I left, and I haven't heard from the leaders since we moved houses. There was an investigation a few years ago and I don't know what has happened to the group. 
Some of you have guessed my country, but still, I don't want to give away too much information about where I live. The reason I won't expose the group is because it would be interfering with the police investigation, if it's still ongoing, and it would bring more attention to myself. When I said we changed identities, I mean we unofficially have started using a new surname. Only our closest relatives know this. We didn't take out a restraining order because it would only lead to court cases and a potential threat to our family. As explained above, a group of the leaders were arrested and charged with harassment. However, more people turned up soon after. I am scared of even googling the group name, as I know that if they tracked me down, it wouldn't end well. I hope you all understand the position I'm in and know that for my family and my own protection, I can't give more than that. I also wanted to say thanks for all the supportive messages. You guys really are the greatest community. Maybe one day there will be a complete resolution to this and I'll be able to tell the full story to you all. So it's clear that OP dislikes the group, but at some point down the line, he would make this comment. This is not true. I was part of a therapy group that specializes in helping teenagers with mental health problems. It was not a cult. Since then, I have decided to rejoin the group. I will answer no further questions on this matter. Very interesting. Some users suspected that the group somehow got their hands on OP and his account and made this post themselves. And OP would disappear for about 5 years before making a post in r slash doll photography saying, Hello, I am fine. Thank you for your concern. Which is the strangest place to leave this update. This update was made on January 1st, 2023. Fast forward one month on February 1st, OP made this post. Hi, I think it's time for things to finally come to light. For the people that are still following this story, this will be my last post. Strap in because it's a long one. Back in 2011, I was studying at college in the UK. Like a lot of teens, I was struggling with my mental health and I'm lucky that my college had a good support network in place for people like me. My college offered me private therapy and got in contact with my doctor to arrange medication. They really helped me. One day, during a private therapy session, I was told about a group that works with college students with mental health problems and was invited to attend a meeting to see what they do. There were about 20 students listening to these two men talking about an exciting opportunity for us, where they would take us to a camp where we could do adventurous things such as rock climbing and archery. But the main goal was to help us learn more about our mental health and through group sessions eventually work through our problems. I signed up. I gave them my contact details, but they said they would need parental permission before I go. I didn't realize that they would show up at my house that evening. I hadn't even had a chance to tell my parents about it. The two men were very persuasive and made the trip sound very enticing to me, but my parents had their doubts. My mom was very suspicious about them showing up to our house unannounced and the long contract that they brought with them. My parents refused to let me go, saying it sounds like a cult, and escorted the men out. And that was it. I had nothing more to do with them. I have no idea what happened at that group but I doubt it was a cult. In fact, it was probably a charity funded group that had genuine and selfless intentions, but I understand my parents skepticism. I don't know anyone who went to the camp and I can't remember the name of the organization and I continued with my private therapy. Fast forward a few years and I'm sitting at my desk at my very first office job, bored mindless and listening to a podcast series about creepy stuff that's happened around the world. One of the episodes was about Heaven's Gate, a famously tragic cult where the founders sought out people who were marginalized, lost, and had mental health issues to join their group. The story triggered some creativity inside me and led me to r slash confessions. The story didn't take me long. I I was just letting the creative juices flow as my co-workers looked on, probably thinking I was working on something really important. But yes, the truth is, is that it was just a spooky story with far too many inconsistencies. This wasn't the first fictional story I posted on Reddit. I found a lot of enjoyment writing weird posts and watching the commenters try to decipher it. One of my personal favorites was a story from the perspective of an American lady convinced that her vegan neighbors were witches. None of these posts gained a lot of attention and I didn't mind, I just enjoyed the writing. About a week after the original post, I was watching a YouTube video about Reddit mysteries. This obviously inspired me to ignore my work and try to flesh out this cult story. 
The intention behind the creepy update was that the cult leaders had somehow gained access to my account and were desperately trying to get rid of the evidence. I wasn't expecting this update to bring as much attention to my story as it did. Reading through all of these theories was really enjoyable for me, even if half of the commenters knew it was fake. There were a few people that seemed to really enjoy digging into the story and it made me feel happy that I provided them with something they could try to figure out. A few more years later, one night, I got into bed and opened up YouTube on my phone. I can't explain the feeling of seeing my stupid story being the focus of one of my favorite YouTubers. Nightmare Expo. I was overwhelmed with joy that he had decided to use my story for one of his videos. The feeling was remarkable. With this video came a lot more attention and a lot more theories. My biggest regret is that I didn't make up a name for this cult because I feel bad that negative attention was being put on random organizations because of this. I tried to be vague to avoid people pointing fingers of who could be behind the cult, and that was pretty much the height of the story. A silly, fictional story that I wrote at my desk instead of doing work. Throughout the years since I've logged into this account and read through the direct messages and checked the new comments under Nexpo's video, I had a lot of fun reading all of your theories and have a lot of love for those who reached out in an effort to help this supposed troubled person. I understand a lot of people were annoyed because they could tell the story was fake, but I still hope that people who took time to work together and investigate the story had some fun too. I've been part of online communities investigating some internet mysteries and it's where I've met some close friends. So that leads us up to now and why I've decided to close this story. The initial intention was to let it fade into nothingness like most other Reddit mysteries, but something changed. About a year ago, I got some bad news from my doctor. Two months ago, I was told that the treatment wasn't working. I haven't got long left. Since I was a teenager, I've always had a fascination with all things spooky. This fascination has got me through some tough times, especially recently when I've needed distractions from the real world. I've spent countless hours in hospitals and clinics investigating online mysteries and feeding my obsession of the weird and wonderful. I've also spent a lot of time reading through theories about my story and I'm happy that some of you found it interesting. But I couldn't take this with me to the grave. Along with letters for my family and friends, I had to leave one for you guys too. To the people at r slash confessions and r slash rbi, to Nightmare Expo and his fans, and to everyone who spent some time exploring this story, thank you. I hope you guys can keep internet mysteries alive, keep investigating, and keep making these online communities going. Please remember to do what you enjoy doing, like I did, while you have the time. Love, throwaway181718.